Welcome back, brethren. We'll continue with Sabbath services today. And I might mention that last Thursday, I turned 87. Okay? Now, here in the congregation, we have two that are older than me, Jack Hassler and Betty Hiles. Betty Hiles is approaching 90, okay? We're thankful for the extra time God has given us. Appreciate all your prayers for me that I can continue as long as God wants me to, to serve him and teach the word of God. So, I'm 87, okay? Was married? 56 and a half years. Good marriage. So we're going to talk about divorce and remarriage today. That was another topic that we had, which took almost one whole day to cover. Because today, the way it is, who is to say who is bound? and who is loosed because of the way that the world is. And there are so many things going on with people and marriages and sexuality. And today now, they're trying to teach children in kindergarten things that they should not be teaching concerning sexuality. And so, rare, rare is the couple that has not had divorce or remarriage. So, to get our ground where we need to be, I'm going to read the sacred wedding ceremony, okay? Okay. And this will give us some guideposts from which we can answer the question, who is bound and who is not bound? And what are the things that may loose a marriage? Here we go. Wedding ceremony. This is a happy and joyous occasion. Marriage is a natural union but a divine institution. It is an ordained, created relationship instituted by Almighty God for man and woman. Well, today, we have it for man and man and woman and woman and man and animal and animal for woman, and pretty soon, robots for man and women. Okay? Don't laugh, it's coming. Originally, this intimate love relationship was created by God himself, for God is love. Physically and spiritually, the marriage estate portrays mankind's supreme destiny of oneness with God and his family in his eternal kingdom. Since Almighty God is the supreme ruler and is our creator, therefore it is only fitting and right that we use the laws and principles of God as the fundamental authority which governed this sacred marriage covenant into which you both are now entering. This is what we have when we have a marriage ceremony. In the beginning, after the Lord God had created Adam, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. Likewise, you can add to that, and the Bible sustains it, that it's not good for a woman to be alone, either. I will make a helper suitable and compatible for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then God took one of the man's ribs, and from it God fashioned a woman, and God brought her to the man. And the man said, now when you read this, listen to what it says. And the man said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. What does this tell you? 
in addition to naming all of the animals and everything, he knew what God was going to do. And he understood where she came from. Okay. So then God adds this, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. Okay. Now, that is the perfect arrangement. Men have tried everything else just like they're trying today. And how's it working out? Not very good. Leads to terrible things mentally, psychologically, emotionally, every other evil thing under the sun. Okay. And then God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So God gave us the whole earth. What a gift, huh? All right. So here the ceremony continues. Today in the presence of these witnesses, we're asking the Lord God Almighty in the name and authority of Jesus Christ to bless this marriage with love, understanding, faithfulness, and dedication to each other, knowing that marriage is honorable in everything. Now notice, love, understanding, faithfulness, and dedication. That's very important because that's missing in so many marriages today. Jesus upheld this honor by teaching, He who created them in the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they are no more two but one flesh, Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Okay, now then. How many marriages today has God bound? With all the evil that's going on, why are we called Sodom and Gomorrah? Because we're not doing anything what I just read, that's why. Okay. And he said, whoever divorces his wife except for the cause of sexual infidelity and marries another commits adultery. And if a woman divorces her husband and is married to another, she commits adultery. Okay. That is, if the wedding was bound by God. See? We'll talk about some other things about that in a bit. Okay. So we see that it is God who joins husband and wife as one flesh, not man. What God has bound, man is commanded by that authority not to separate. What God has bound, only God can loose is revealed in his holy word. So that becomes the question. What did he bind and what did he lose? A marriage so bound and blessed by God is binding for life. See? For better, for worse, in sickness and health, in want or in wealth, unto death do they part. Okay. Now, not many can say that today. Right? Now, I can look back. Dolores and I entered in our marriage with this in mind. We had a great marriage. Like all marriages, we had some ups and downs. Dolores was smart. She was caring. She was good. She was a great mother, a great wife. Okay? And we had five children together first one of which died by being born premature, and all of the rest of the children, okay? Now, we had our ups and downs with the children because of the society we live in and because I had to be gone much of the time, but Dolores was great as a wife, as a director of the family while I was gone, and did well. 
We loved each other. We understood each other. And we were faithful to the end. And that's the way God wants every marriage to be. And today, never works out that way in too many cases. Okay. Now let us understand the New Testament instruction concerning the marriage estate. Okay. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband. That's a requirement of God. Now, Stephen Green gave a very good message on that on Go to Meeting. So I want to get that one and put it up online. Because, see, as long as the man is single, as long as the woman is single, they govern and rule their own lives, correct? But when they're married, you can't have two heads. Jesus said, you'll either love one or hate the other or despise one and love the other one, okay? So you can't have it that way. And so God made the woman as the weaker vessel. But perfect for being a woman. And there are certain things about women that men never understand. And there are certain things about men women never understand. Remember when you had the one with Rex Harrison? What was, what was that movie? And he sang the song, Oh, why can't a woman be more like a man? <laughs> Seven years. Yeah. She can't. Look at what's happening today, trying to have this gender change, huh? Chemicals, operations, all of this, ruining and destroying lives, okay? So the wife has to, by choice, voluntarily submit herself to her husband. And the husband has to, what? Love his wife, right? And treat her with honor and respect as the weaker vessel. See? He's not to rule over her with an iron fist. He's not to put her down. See? You work together. And that's how our marriage works. And that's how my wife was able to, how shall we put it, blossom into a full functioning woman her whole life. Okay? And after the kids grew up and were gone, she was able to work and became executive secretary for one of the leading real estate offices over in Gilroy, John Felice, who was the head of it. She made good money. The only thing I required of her with her money was, you buy the food, I pay the bills. She was happy with that. <laughs> and she got a lot of things for the house that way. Okay? So you have to come into marriage to understand how you work together because you're one flesh. Okay? Wives, submit yourself to your own husband as unto the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. How does Christ teach, treat us? With love, understanding, forgiveness, kindness, right? Isn't that true? Yes. And he is the Savior, deliverer, provider of the body, in exactly the same manner as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything in the marriage estate. Okay? Now for the husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Exactly in the same manner as church, 
Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for, in order that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of the water of the word of God. Okay? Now, the same way with us. See? We are to treat our wives in such a way in loving them that they become better, that they respond and love us, and we love them. See? That's the way it has to be. That he might place her beside himself as a glorious, untarnished church, not having a single spot or stain, wrinkle or blemish, or any such thing, but that she might be consecrated, holy, and completely blameless. Okay. Now listen to this. In exactly the same way, the husband's are duty-bound and under obligation to God to love their wives as their own body. The man who is loving his wife in this manner loves himself because no one truly hates his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it exactly as the Lord does the church. See? For this mystery is great, immense, and supreme, for I'm speaking concerning the relationship between Christ and the church, the bride of Christ, and their eternal destiny. However, let every one of you also be loving his own wife as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Okay? Now notice, most of the instructions are placed on who? on the man, right? What do we have today? Women ruling, right? Now, in the case of Deborah, when there were no men strong enough to handle it, Deborah became a judge and she went to war and told Barak who was supposed to go and wage the roar, she said, I'll go with you, but this is a woman's victory. Okay? Well, today, things are so upside down and backward. Now we have, now we have house husbands, and the wife goes out and supports the family. Okay? How does that work? Well, I don't know. You have to ask those who do it. Okay? Now, the Apostle Peter continues God's instruction in the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, from your heart. Very important. You can't have double-mindedness of either one, of husband and wife. See, because the question becomes today, what do you do when there is a marriage where both of them say, I do, and one of them in their heart says, I don't? And if this doesn't work out the way I want it, I'm out of here. You think God's going to bind that marriage? Never. That's a fraudulent marriage, see? And there are some people that do it that way, both men and women, okay? It's so bad today that people say, well, I'm not going to get married, but we'll, we'll live together. So they live together. But that's not how God made it, see? There has to be the formal acceptance of the covenant. It's a covenant. What did God do to ensure the new covenant? The death of Christ, correct? What do we do to join it? Baptism, correct? Which is a symbolic death. Because if I don't raise you out of the water and hold you under there and take my hand off your nose, you're not going to come up alive, right? So that's as close to death as you can come. See? And you wives, be submissive to your own husbands from your heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God and will melt the heart of your husband in love. Right? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. See? 
Thus did Sarah obey Abraham, calling him Lord. Likewise, you husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, the best you can. See, Women go through different things that men do not go through because of the cycle of life that she has in her body. There are times when she's very happy and all of this. There are other times when she's grouchy and munchy because of the time of the month and so forth. Okay, That's all part of it. So you understand. See, As with a weaker vessel, and grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay. Now, here's the sacred marriage covenant. Now, this is a covenant. Okay. A covenant must be entered into with no reservation. A covenant must be entered into with full and open knowledge. And you cannot be double-minded and be duplicitous in this ceremony which happens too many times. I've been dealing with a case lately that there are three marriages involved on both sides. And how do you figure out who's bound to whom? And how do you know who's telling the right story? And how do you know? I mean, look at some of the things that both men and women, but in particularly women, that they can be sly and sneaky and conceal their inner thoughts more than men. Okay? So you don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden, after marriage, things blow up because it's not, they're not following what it is here. Now here's what happens. Sacred Marriage Covenant. We are today in the presence of God coming before his very throne in heaven above, and we're asking God to join you as husband and wife. Therefore, in accordance with God's word, each of you should solemnly promise a promise you can not break, and a promise you must enter into with full knowledge. You can't come into it with any hesitation or reservation in your mind. Because if you do, that's not a marriage. How can it be? Because your promise is worthless. That's why we have to solemnly promise. What if God treated us the way some men and some women treat their husbands and wives. Huh? He promises one thing, then later on says, well, I didn't mean that. Well, you promised eternal life, but I didn't mean that. Solemnly promise, okay? Before God. Not just the people. See, before God, in the presence of these witnesses, to accept the sacred marriage covenant according to the conditions set forth and imposed by Almighty God as revealed in his holy word. Okay. Do you, the man, first name, enter into covenant with God? Now you see what the emphasis is on? See? In the presence of these witnesses to take the woman's full name, to be your lawful wedded wife until death, as the scriptures command. Okay? For better, for worse. Nothing here about fraud. Nothing here about wrong intentions. 
just for better or for worse as life comes, okay? In sickness or in health, because everyone's gonna get sick, right? That's just the nat nature of human beings. In want or in wealth. There are times you won't have much, there'll be other times you have more. To cleave to her, to love her as Christ loves the church, to honor her, cherish her, and provide for her. Okay? Then he says, I do. Now then do you, woman's first name, enter into covenant with God. See, both. Covenant with God. The only way that a marriage is going to be binding by God is if you both have pure hearts and pure motives and nothing in the back of your mind that you're going to pull the trigger on later on. See? Otherwise, that's fraud. And fraud falls into the same category as adultery, right? See? In the presence with God, in the presence of these witnesses to take the man, his full name, to be your lawful wedded husband, until death is the scripture's command, for better, for worse, in sickness or in health, in want or in wealth, and to submit yourself to him in everything in the marriage estate as the church does to Christ and honor and reverence him. And she says, I do. Okay. Now then, when it is that way, that's a binding marriage. Okay. Just because there's a wedding ceremony, just because there are minister reading these words, does not bind a marriage. God alone can bind it based upon the pureness of heart and pureness of motivation when they have the ceremony. Can you bind a woman to a man who's going to be a rough bully and she's beaten up? Like one minister beat up his wife. She came to another woman in the church. She had this big old black eye. And finally, she had to pour out her heart to her and say, this man of mine is just a monster. He beats me. He belittles me. He puts me down. He tells me how awful I am, and so forth. That would be grounds for a proper divorce. God does not expect you to be married to someone who is going to beat you up. See? Now, have there been cases like that? Okay. God doesn't want it. Okay. I can tell you this. In all 56 and a half years, Dolores never slapped me on the face, and I never slapped her on the face. <laughs> okay. We always work things out, and sometimes it takes a while to work them out. But God is the only one who binds. And in sitting down and talking to those who are divorced to try and figure out. Now, is this a bound marriage or not? Everyone's going to tell the best story about themselves. Right? Are you going to sit down and tell someone how evil and mean and nasty you have been to your husband or to your wife? Huh? No, you're not. You may bring out some things that are not right. But you're not going to confess to anyone how bad you have been as a wife or a husband. That's why it's so difficult to understand who is bound today. See? 
So, it has to be bound by God based on the promise which has to be pure and no reservations. It's the only way it's going to be binding. See? And then, each of you love each other, come together as husband and wife, and you're wanting to do the things that please each other and God. See? But, unfortunately, the world has crept into the church too much. And what about if the husband or the wife had done things before their marriage that really affected their character, really made them, how shall we say, prone to evil. But how would you ever know unless they, he or she told you? You'd never know. And then you find out later. See? Now how about if you have a man or woman when they have problems and difficulties, all they do is condemn and lie about you. No case of one woman, all she did was, was every time her husband was not there at the house, right on time, you're committing adultery. You're committing adultery. You're committing adultery. Okay. Finally, she made things so bad he had to leave her. That can't be a bound marriage. How can that be a bound marriage? Is she saying, I love you? I appreciate you working so hard? No. Falsely accusing. See? That can't be. So it makes it difficult. Now, we can carry that out to, to things today where what about if there's homosexual activity in the past? Okay. Both male and female. Let me show you something here, the book of Romans. Romans, the first chapter. The only way that God is in our lives is if we submit to God, right? And his word and his truth and his laws and his commandments, that we believe God, correct? That we love God. Now what happens when all of that goes out the window? What happens when we have it like it is today? Because I need to bring a sermon on genomics. Okay? Little sidebar. Why is China getting the DNA of people from every nation in the world? What are they going to do with that? It's going to be bad news. Okay? And China has nothing to do with God, except China is a hand of punishment from God. and will be the hand of punishment for this nation because of what we do. And we will see how that comes about right here in Romans, the first chapter. Okay, no, verse 20. For the invisible things of him are perceived from the creation of the world, being understood by the things that were made. Because what makes it go, the thing that was made, was something they can't see, called the spirit. Spirit of man and human beings, spirit of animals and animals. Okay? The power of life. Same way with plants. Okay? Both is eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful, but they were vain in their own reasonings, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Okay. 
while professing themselves to be the wise one, they became the fools. Whatever it may be, in science, in technology, in medicine, in the word of God, in human relations, in human sexuality. Okay. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the likeness of an image of corruptible man and birds and four-footed creatures and creeping things. And that's what's happened. Okay. The other sermon, part of the sermon I wanted to bring today, which fits right in with this, but I'll have to bring it separately, which is this. They are working genetically to create a combination of human beings with animal genes. And uh, even the United States government has committed $250 million to do it, just here in America. Okay? And they're trying to create Shermans. That is part man, part animal. And remember Genesis 11, we'll come back to that again later, where it says, this they begin to do, now nothing shall be kept from them that they imagined to do. Okay? That's where we are. They even say in one place, what we can do with genetics is make man think right. I want you to grasp that. Total mind control. That's something. Now here's what happens when they get to that point. For this cause, God abandoned them. Now when God abandons you, who moves in? Huh? Who moves in? Satan the devil. That's right. And look what happened. Abandoned them to the uncleanness of the lust of their own hearts and disgraced their own bodies between themselves. The first thing they do is go after perverted sex. Right? Isn't that the history? Isn't that what they're doing? All right. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and called the truth of God lies. And they worshiped and served the created thing more than the one whose creator is blessed into the ages. Amen. Now notice what happens if there's no change. Notice what takes place. See? Again, for this cause, God abandoned them to disgraceful passions, for even their women changed the nature of use of sex into that which is contrary to nature. That comes first. How did that begin? Well, it began with Eve. <laughs> okay. But how did it begin here? Women's rights and abortion. And the reason we have everything going wrong in America today is not because we don't have the right economics or any of the other plans that they have. It's because they've left out God. See? And the women, with the assistance of doctors, have killed 62 million unborn innocent blood. That is blood that God is going to revenge upon this nation, and there's no other nation more hateful to do it than China. See? That's where we are with this. So the women, okay? Then what happens? That causes a lot of homosexuality with men. Okay? Both ways. For even the women change in natural use contrary to nature. Verse 27. In the same manner also men having left the natural use of sex with women, 
were inflamed in their lustful passions toward one another, men with men, shamelessly committing lewd acts and receiving back within themselves a fitting penalty for their error. Okay. Now we've already fulfilled the first two God abandonments. Look what's next. In exact proportion as they did not consent to have God in their knowledge. Now, I want you to listen when you watch the news and see all the propositions for trying to straighten out the economy, trying to straighten out the border. And let me tell you this, they'll never straighten out the border until they stop abortion, period. Because God is sending one immigrant, legal or illegal, for every one that has been aborted. See? Because we're not teaching our young people the seriousness of life and the far-reaching ramifications of sexuality. Okay? In exact proportion as they did not consent to have God in their knowledge, God abandoned them. So God says this, you don't want me with you? All right. I'm going to leave you on your own to a reprobate mind. That's what we're entering into with this genome. A reprobate mind. What is that? One that thinks they are God. And if you think you can change the genes of people, and if you think you're going to make them right, you are a reprobate from God and sitting in the seat of God. Okay. Continues on here. And to practice those things that are immoral. That's the way that it is. Okay. So how then? Is this nation going to go forward? We don't know. We do not know. But let me tell you, every day there's no rain. Every dam in California loses water. And pretty soon, the dams will run so low that the water generating of electricity will cease. And where will millions and millions and millions of people be without water, without electricity? They need to think on those things. That's where we are. So sorry to bring you some good news mixed with all the bad, but that's the way that it is, and we have to see it for what it is and understand it for what it is, and that way we can draw closer to God so that we don't fall into the trap of the world. So we'll end it for here and see you next week.